but to study people like you do and try to identify the cause, the genetic causes, the genetic factors behind some complex trait like depression, what kind of scale do we need to be working at? Typically interrogate something like between one to five million positions in the genome. So for each person in the study, we might get one to five million pieces. Now this becomes, guess what? One level of machine learning problem. Can we make predictions from all the genetic signals we're collecting to, to, to recognize subgroups and so on? Jonathan, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. I can't believe you're here. This is such an exciting moment for me. John, I'm very pleased to be your guest today. So Jonathan was my PhD supervisor at Oxford. Uh, so 10 years ago, I finished my PhD. And so I, I, I guess I've seen you in person maybe once since I, when I defended into my dissertation, maybe about eight years ago, but I can't remember for sure if I actually saw you then. And I had plans to see you in LA because the company that acquired my company was, we have an LA office, but then the pandemic hit and we even had plans. I was going to see you in the autumn. We had specific plans and my flight was canceled everything because COVID kicked back up in LA. But anyway, so you're not in Oxford anymore. You're in LA. How's it going out there on the West Coast? It's great here, John. Wonderful lifestyle, great colleagues, great place to live. So you don't miss the sun going down at 3 p.m. and it raining all the time. I don't miss the <laughs> overcast days, the constant temperature at about four degrees centigrade. I've missed, I've missed none of that. Now you also, in Oxford, you would cycle everywhere all the time. Are you still cycling everywhere? In LA, you of must course. drive, right? Yeah. No, no. Oh, I, you I, are? You cycle Yeah, everywhere. yeah. I cycle in today. I cycle in every day. Yeah. Wow. All right. Yeah. Is that a long commute for you? Uh, it's about th six miles. Oh, that's not bad at all. No, it's Very not nice. bad at all. No, it's a perfect Lovely. cycling city. There's, uh, it's always sunny here. The streets are flat. And um, this, the uh, cars here have never seen a cyclist. So they, they behave <laughs> very sensibly and they give me right away. It's, it's, um, it's good. Wow. All right. Wonderful. So you're at UCLA and you're tackling something called the Depression Grand Challenge, which sounds grand indeed. It is a project that's going to take several decades to carry out, and it plans to raise over half a billion dollars in funding. Um, so how did you get involved in this grand challenge? Why are you doing this? Okay, so let, let me go back a little and just explain why I'd be involved in this at, at all in the first place. And um, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my background. I think that gives you the, the, the necessary uh, context for this. So when I was a teenager, my mother was working for an organization called the Samaritans, which was the first, I think, certainly in the UK, maybe in the world, to organize suicide helplines. Mm -hmm. And uh, during one grim Christmas, when everyone is um, you know, eaten and drunk too much and not wanting to talk anymore, my mother said, why didn't I accompany her to go into the center of London and man one of the suicide lines? So I was like, no way, I can't do this. No, it's going to be dangerous. I'm going to be really unable. And she said, no, 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 I'll be with her. So she convinced me and I came and I sat in a crypt of a church in the center of London. And there's a bank of telephones in front of us. And uh, one of them rings and I pick it up. And my mother looks at me and says, oh, you can do it. Oh, okay, I'll take the call. And at the end of the phone, there's a woman who tells me uh, that she wants to kill herself, that she has the pills in front of her. And she talks and she talks. And at the end, she says, thank you for listening. I'm not going to kill myself. I'm going to throw away the pills. Wow. And for the first time, I realized that I could do something, that even listening is something. And in fact, that's something we can all do. It's not a, a, a huge problem that we can't confront. No, we can all get involved in this. So as you know, I'm a psychiatrist. And being a psychiatrist, there's lots more stuff I can do. I can give pills and and I can give psychotherapy to, to my patients. But fundamentally, that approach uh, hasn't changed. And I think we can all get involved in this. It's a problem that's um, extremely prevalent. Almost everybody, if they haven't suffered themselves, will know somebody who's involved in this condition. Mm -hmm. And it's so broad, so, so um, touching so many different parts of our lives that you really need a, a joined-up approach to tackle this. Now, 
every department of psychiatry in the country will have people working on, on the causes of depression and trying to improve things. But that initiative is not enough. You need something like the National Institute for Depression. And Australia has got closest to doing that. Um, mm. But in the US, the one place that really caught my imagination was UCLA. And they, they tackled this, uh, as, as you've said, as a, as a grand challenge. In other words, some, something where, where we could make a transformative change in a, in a major problem in society. And there was a series of meetings around how to do this. And I attended those meetings and offered, they ended up offering me a job. And how could I resist? This is the problem that I, I've been tackling all my life and they were doing it on the right scale. So I came. And we've been running now for about five years. And it's an uphill struggle, no doubt about that. But we are making progress. And so the idea here is that there is some genetic basis to depression, and that by understanding this genetic basis, we might be able to treat better. Um, and yeah. So so okay. So I'm a, my my training is as a, as a psychiatrist, and we use genetics as a tool. So um, on a, on a sort of general scale, but we can talk about it this a bit more, every human behavior, in fact, almost all parts of physiology, everything varies. So we all know height, and weight varies, so does mood. Uh, and because of the way biology works, there will be genetic variants which are associated with that variation. So it gives, if you can find those genetic variants, it gives you a handle on the condition because you've then got a handle through the genetics of the biology. Now, that's not to say, and many people misunderstand this, that, that the environmental effects are not important. They are hugely important, particularly in something like depression. And there are many people who become depressed because of something bad happening to them. That's an environmental stressor. But that's not to say that the genetic effects are also not important, even in those circumstances, because we know that you need to have a certain degree of genetic predisposition before an environmental stressor will really upset you. And we all know people who've survived catastrophes unscathed. Why does that happen? How do we explain this huge variation? It's not just down to one genetic predisposition. There are other things going on uh, that contribute to this. Right. So uh, for any trait or any even physiological trait, behavioral trait that an organism has, that a living thing has, including people, uh, some of the influence on that is genetic. Some of it is environmental. And that means basically anything that isn't genetic, <laughs> right? That yes, that's essentially genetic. what it means. Yeah. Uh, so the every single stimulus that you encounter over your lifetime, this is some kind of environmental influence. So uh, with depression, for example, it could be things like, you know, socioeconomic status is an environmental factor. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that you can study. Okay, what was the socioeconomic status and put the person in a bucket. But then in practice as an individual, it's literally every single thing that's ever happened to you uh, from, I from the instant that the egg was fertilized by a sperm this yep. in utero um, as a child as an adult all of these experiences are your environment correct um, so you mentioned so we have genetic influences on any trait including uh, depression susceptibility to depression severity of depression um, environmental factors influence it and then you mentioned there this gene by environment interaction mm -hmm. as well so uh, this idea that uh, two people with uh, different genetics exposed to the same environmental conditions, which, of course, in practice, you can't ever have exactly the same environmental mm -hmm. conditions mm -hmm. as somebody else. But if you could, then people with different genetics would react differently to that environment. And one could become depressed, the other not, um, just as I suppose one could become taller than the other um, in, in, in different kinds of environmental conditions. Um, so we have a genetic component to any trait, including depression, an environmental component, and this gene by environment component. And if I remember correctly from my PhD, which is now a decade past, there are studies from twins raised apart. And I think Kenneth Kendler is a big name in, that, in these kinds of studies. So you compare... How do identical well, you, twins? You, 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 don't, you don't. You don't need to have the twins reared apart. I mean, that's a very rare phenomenon. I mean, oh, Ken's work has always been provided, on. So, oh, okay. I thought that provided I mean, some of the richest data. When you had the twins raised apart, is a they're very there are there are those studies have been much 
advertise because they <laughs> are so unusual. And Tom Bouchard has, has run this for, for, for many years to, to find these people. But the, but the trouble with them, there are so few of them that you right. don't really get a good estimate of, of some of the parameters that you want to look at. I mean, the, the reason that they, they got a people's attention was because it was hard to argue that there was a common in, that, that, that they, there was something special about the environment the twins were raised in because they were obviously they, they were separated. And then people argued, well, maybe you know early on they were together, and that was what was important. And how important were the, the early? So I, I think one one can put that aside and just say no, twin yeah. studies twin studies by themselves are pretty informative. Nice. Okay. And then so it's the it's then the difference in behavior in some trait like depression between identical twins versus fraternal twins that that the differences matter and it doesn't matter whether they were raised apart or not so no. much no not so much this turns out to be quite a, 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 a rather specialist sample but yes so there are twins who are genetically identical so therefore any differences you see between them have to be environmental there are a few little wrinkles on that but as a general rule that's a good starting point and then there are twins who are like brothers and sisters so they share half their genetic material and by comparing the two sets of twins, you can come to some estimate of the extent to which genetic variation contributes to the heritability of the trait. Right, okay, and then so, if I remember correctly, as kind of a general rule of thumb, for a lot of complex traits, including depression, about a third of the variation in depression is genetic, about a third of it is environmental, and then the remaining third are these gene by environment interactions. I don't think we have a we don't really have a figure on the contribution of the gene by environment, but but in but you but roughly it's about thirty five percent is is heritable and the rest we say is environmental, which essentially means we don't know what's going on. <laughs> we just there's too many possible yeah. uh, influential factors and we yeah. can't control for all of them. So about thirty five percent genetic. Okay. Many thanks to the Master of Data Science program at the University of California, Irvine for sponsoring today's episode. The UC Irvine Master of Data Science program blends statistics and computer science principles with partners from industry to empower students to innovate in the field of data science. Located on the tech coast of Southern California, students of the program will enjoy a powerhouse ecosystem where over a third of Fortune 500 companies are located. Take a giant leap in your data science career through the UC Irvine Master of Data Science program. To learn more, head to superdatascience.com slash UCI. That's superdatascience.com slash UCI. Check it out. So how does understanding that, say, a particular gene is likely to be causal to some extent of depression. And I know that any individual gene con contributing contributes a small amount, but let's say, let's, let's oversimplify for a second and say that you could find a gene that was hugely responsible for whether somebody uh, had depression or not. What could we then do with that information? Why is it helpful? Okay, so let, to, to, we need a bit of, bit of context for that. Uh, so um, and I think the starting point really has to be to think a little bit about what depression is and, and, and what it isn't. And, right. uh, and making a diagnosis is not that straightforward. Um, like if I'm talking with you now and I ask you, John, are you feeling, or have you felt in the last couple of weeks a bit down? You'd probably say, yes, there's been a few times. And so sometimes when you haven't slept too well, you'd probably say yes. And I could sort of elicit without, some difficulty, without much difficulty many of the symptoms that, are, that would be diagnostic of, of, of depression. So there's a, there's a bit of an art uh, clinical art in really establishing whether someone has got depression. So that's a, a starting point. And we don't. And, and when I when I ask those questions of you, I'm drawing upon decades of experience from clinicians who try to work out what it was that characterised depression. Not because it comes from any understanding of the underlying neurobiology. We, we've, we're just asking clini clinical questions. So at that level, you can think of it as a syndrome. It's a set of of features. And what's unusual about depression, probably almost unique, is that you can have completely opposite traits and still qualify. So if you mm -hmm. are sleeping very poorly and getting up early, that, that will feature. But you may also be sleeping longer. Uh, you may be losing your appetite and eating less, but you may also be eating more than usual. And weirdly, right. both of those, I mean, both of those can increase your your, you know, your score for, for being diagnosed as depressed. 
So given that, it's not, I think, too much of a stretch to realize that depression is almost certainly not one disease. And that when we deal with it, it's a bit like we were dealing with cancer, but we didn't know that there's a blood cancer and that that there's a a, a lung cancer. All we know is that some abnormality of the cells and they keep on dividing. So it's a bit like that with depression, that we have this phenotype that the clinicians have difficulty eliciting. And we, we know that there's some genetic component. But really, beyond that, we are pretty much at sea. So one of the first questions we want to answer is, is it one disease? How many diseases? And what are the characteristics of those? And here the genetics becomes very useful because if it's not one disease, then you would expect there to be different constellations of genetic factors operating. Now this becomes, guess what? One level of machine learning problem. Can we make predictions from all the genetic signals we're collecting to to, to recognize subgroups and so on? So the way we think about this is that, is that um, genetic, I mean, you will know this, but many people won't, that in common with other complex traits, we regard it as polygenic. That's to say there isn't a single gene. There's not two, there's not three, not even 10, not 100. No, there are thousands, probably tens of thousands of genetic predispositions spread across the genome. And each of those makes a tiny, tiny contribution, increasing your risk by a, a minuscule amount. Like a, if you put this as an odds ratio, you know, 1.01 would not be unreasonable. If we find things that are 1.2, 1.3, we're really, really happy. But it's the majority of them are going to be really tiny, tiny effects. Um, and uh, we'll come to what those understanding those individual effects might might tell us. And that was really about your question about about genes. But I think before we get to that point, we can use the genetic data in a, in a in a way to answer this more fundamental question, which is: Are we dealing with a single disease or multiple diseases? Because if you didn't distinguish the group and then you found your what you think is the causative gene, let's say, and you work at, work on what it's doing, it may be that that's something completely unrelated to many of the uh, conditions that we're actually interested in. It might be some comorbid feature. It might be some consequence that is. It's very hard just on that single starting point to understand what the gene would be doing. So that's a bit of a long answer, but I, but I, but I, you, the question you ask is, is is germane. Many people ask that, but I think to to get to the root of this, you've got to step back a little bit and understand what the condition is. Yeah, that was a really great answer. All right, thank you, Jonathan, for that overview of how genetics contributes to behavior, especially to depression. Now, if people want to learn a lot about this particular topic. There's a great book recommendation that I have for them, and that's How Genes Influence Behavior. And, huh, you just happen to be the author of that book. Wow, Um, what a surprise. (laughs) So the second edition uh, came out in 2020, so quite up to date. Jonathan, what do you cover in that book, and who's the intended audience? Well, this book started as a collaboration set of conversations between myself, my colleague Ken Kendler, uh, and Ralph Greenspan. And uh, Ralph is uh, a Drosophila geneticist. He works on flies. Uh, Ken's uh, only ever worked on human genetics, and I crossed the boundary between mouse genetics and, and humans. So we we came at this from dif- different angles, and our main intention was to try and uh, both educate and we hoped also entertain. Uh, we'd originally written this for fun as a as a we thought it would be important to get our message out, and we didn't have a particular audience in mind. But then when we went to a publisher and tried to get someone to publish it, they asked that question, and uh, we said, <laughs> we don't know. So we ended up working with Oxford University Press, who has published it as a textbook for undergraduates and first-year postgraduates in psychology uh, and psychiatry. Nice. And yeah, so roughly, what does it cover? Uh, in the beginning, I suppose it kind of, it, it so introduces... We, we, yeah. we, we, we wanted to cover um, both the phenomenology of psychiatric disease, uh, together with the what, what is known about its predisposition, uh, and also how from model organisms we have information about how genetic effects impinge upon behavior. Because obviously, experimentally, there's much more you can do with mice and flies. And there are lessons from those experiments to teach us uh, what is the answer to the question we pose, namely how do genes influence behavior? Yep, yep, yep. And so, yeah, of course, with fruit flies, Drosophila, they breed very quickly. 
I imagine it's maybe every few days. Indeed, can, yeah, we can yeah. get lots of flights quickly. Yeah, have to keep an eye on them. <laughs> what are you guys up to in there? Well, um, it's, it's more that you know the fly geneticists have to go off to sort of check on their virgins because they don't want to get them inseminated unnecessarily, and so on. <laughs> that's the day to day life. Of that's my, the day to day life of the fly. <laughs> Fly geneticist, yeah. But surely, uh, well, I guess, yeah, because I would say, well, you just keep them separate, but that's hard if they're breeding all the time. Correct, yeah, not uh, so easy. Ah, now you begin to realize. And then, and fruit flies are so tiny, they're just a few millimeters long, so you've got to, how do you, you get in there? You, with, have, a, like, you have a little little sucking tube, you suck them up <laughs> and put them into it. It's an art, it's an art. It's like an it's eye dropper. Like, yeah, if you, were, if you want, uh, hold on a second, I can just show you. This is getting a little technical, but maybe your audience will be interested in this. This is fly pushing. It's Ralph That's Greenspan's book, and it answers all the questions uh, that um, you might um, ever want to know about actually really? how to handle the flies, how to breed them, how setting up a cross. Um, it's all in here. It's this very, very, very hands-on te technology. Because it's one of those books we has got one of these sort of um, wire binders in the middle, so you know, it opens on your, on your bench while you're doing the experiments. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, so this is probably a surprise to a lot of listeners that fruit flies are a key model animal uh, in, in the study of behavior. And it's while there are certainly a lot of differences between a human and a fly, um, it's surprising at a, um, at a, in terms of how our biochemistry works, in terms of how we uh, use energy or consume nutrients, there's still a lot of, a lot of, common underlying genetics um so yeah in terms of just how our cells behave there's all of these these underlying commonalities and then even surprisingly for something that we think is quite complex like behavior there's still commonalities aren't there jonathan between uh behavioral patterns in a fly mm. and a person mm. so the key person here was seymour benzer who in caltech decided to take the power of fly genetics and, and apply it to behavior much berated at the time people said that wasn't possible. It was fine to do it with physiology and metabolism, but behavior. And he set up experiments to try and identify genes involved in learning and memory, which eventually was successful. And to everyone's astonishment, the genes that he identified turned out to be the same genes in mammals, including you and me. Wow. And then so as an example of something that we can do with fruit flies that you couldn't do with a human, and that would probably even be trickier with a mouse, is there are, well, at the time that I was in Oxford, this was really cutting edge, was, um, was changing the genetics. So, so putting, inserting genes into the fruit fly genome so that you could activate particular uh, neural pathways, particular behaviors by shining a laser on the fruit flies. <laughs> So, yes, you're right. I mean, this is technology that um, uh, my colleague Gero Miesenberg developed um, it's uh, also it is available in in mice. So that the whole approach, which is called optogenetics, has really transformed neurobiology because you can, as you said, go in and activate a part of the mouse's brain, the mouse's part of the fly's brain, and test how brains function. You can do experiments on what you think neurons might be doing. Cool. Yeah, and obviously that. Uh, that doesn't get past university ethics research uh, boards when you want to do it to people. Well, you can't do that on people yet. But um, on the other hand, our ability, as you know, to sort of um, use computers to uh, allow us to uh, activate different parts of the body so you can try and get people with spinal cord injuries to um, right. to overcome their, 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 their disabilities has made huge leaps and bounds. And deep brain stimulation. Indeed, and deep brain stimulation. Yeah. Put that, put, yeah. So this, we're not that far off. Cool. So a question that I have related to this is, so we, so we have this idea, okay, in fruit flies, we can get lots of data, we can do lots of experiments on them um, because, you know, the fruit flies breed more quickly, so it, it naturally allows us to get a lot more genetic variability. With people, we don't... Uh, breed nearly as often. We're not uh, having a new generation every few days. It takes decades, typically. Um, but to study people like you do and try to identify the cause, the genetic causes, the genetic factors behind some complex trait like depression, what kind of scale do we need to be working at to identify these genes? 
So remember we talked a little bit before about how the genetic effects on behavior, on depression, as I'm interested in, but this is true for diseases like schizophrenia as, as well as other medically important traits. The genetic effects are tiny, so each gene mm -hmm. variant is making a very small contribution. In order to detect that, you need a very large sample size. This is just a standard power problem. And if you want to make a, 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 a really robust detection of a small signal, you will need to analyze a large number of people. And to put this into further context, we are interrogating entire genomes. So the genome, three billion bases of it, uh, has a, a structure to it, um, and we understand that structure pretty well. So we don't necessarily need to get entire genome sequences, but we typically interrogate something like between one to five million positions in the genome. So for each person in the study, we might get one to five million pieces. And I'm sure you, you and probably most of your audience realize that if you want to detect a signal out of that number, uh, you've already got a problem because you've encountered a multiple testing issues. If I apply a standard sort of 5% significance threshold out of 1 million tests, I'm going to have to divide uh, 0.05 by a million. So I'm already down to 10 to the minus 8. Uh, and that means that I'm detecting a very weak signal with a very, a very high threshold. So the right. sample sizes go up and up in order to address both those issues. And we typically run sample sizes in the orders of tens, if not the hundreds of thousands. And there are now studies um, being published which uh, exceed one million subjects. Wow. And that makes a lot of sense to me. And so that's a big part of this depression grand challenge, right? That's part of why it needs to be a half billion dollar project, because each of the genes contributing to depression contributes such a small amount of the variance in whether somebody is depressed or not. And then we have potentially tens of thousands of these genes interacting yeah. uh, across millions of positions in the genome. Yeah. And then, yeah, these very, very small uh, p-value thresholds uh, uh, because of this multiple testing problem. And so, yeah, so millions, uh, yeah. Is there, a, is there a target for the depression grand challenge as to how many uh, well, we, 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 when we go out and fundraise and try to get people interested, we, we say 100,000. But the reason we say 100,000 is because it's a big number, really. I mean, <laughs> we don't honestly know quite how many is going to be uh, necessary. I suspect that may be an underestimate. It really depends upon the answer to the first question, which is how many diseases are we dealing with? And if we could identify a right. subgroup in that which was more homogenous and would give us more of a right. signal than we could get away with it. But it may, we don't know the answer to that yet. But let's say 100,000 is a reasonable guess. Struggling with broken pipelines, stale dashboards, missing data? You're not alone. Look no further than Monte Carlo, the leading end-to-end -end data observability platform. In the same way that New Relic and Datadog ensure reliable software and keep application downtime at bay, Monte Carlo solves the costly problem of data downtime. As detailed in episode number 499 with the firm's brilliant CEO, Bar Moses, Monte Carlo monitors and alerts for data issues across your data warehouses, lakes, ETL, and business intelligence, reducing data incidents by 90% or more. Start trusting your data with Monte Carlo today. Visit www.montecarlodata.com to learn more. And then I suppose it also becomes more complex if you want to have more and more um, kind of broad, apl broad applicability across the planet. Mm -hmm. So what's true for a European population might be different for an Asian population that's, than an African population. Absolutely true. And we've already begun to tackle this. As you probably know, I've been running large studies in China. and We had some success there. We've recently been funded to set up a large study in South Korea. And some of my colleagues here are working both in South America and Africa, collecting large samples for exactly that reason. And there's another reason also, which is that, as you say, the, the variants that may predispose in one population are not necessarily quite the same as another. And that allows us to do some interesting uh, comparisons between populations. So that if we think a particular variant is important in one population, we can test whether that might or might not be true by looking at its presence or absence in a second population. And mm -hmm. that will give us better information as to whether it's causative or not. So we can we can both exploit the differences between populations to help us, uh, as well as use the ancestry differences to make diagnosis, as it were, 
di genetic diagnosis in the different populations. Right, right, right. So if it's the case that there's genes that are common between flies and people in learning, for example, then it could be the case that there are some common genes across different uh, ethnicities in one species that are causative of these uh, yeah, of, of depression. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. So other than uh, going around telling people how big your project is and how much money it's going to need, um, what's your life like day to day as a professor at UCLA on this depression grant challenge? I would say about half of our time is spent uh, fundraising and uh, really half uh, of your time. Yeah, pretty much. So it's either wow. grant, grant writing or involved in philanthropy oh, right, right, right. and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and whatever we 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 we, we prostitute ourselves for, for anything really. I mean, <laughs> we just we just want the money, so we'll do whatever whatever it takes. All right, and then the other half. The other half is um, mostly for me because I'm, uh, although I'm a clinician, I don't uh, treat patients here, uh, is on the research and the teaching, the mentorship with, that goes with that. Research, teaching, mentorship. Um, so, yeah, so you have a lab, you have, uh, so the, the grant money comes in and then you have uh, PhD students and postdocs. And yeah. um, so maybe you're directly mentoring Postdocs, I guess, primarily. Yeah, um, most, mostly. Yeah. Yeah. And then they have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah the other thing yeah. is at the moment, because um, because of this, we, we work with very large data sets. Uh, a lot of this is, is dry lab stuff, it's computational. Uh, and as you know, computational people tend to be not that social. They like to stay at home <laughs> in front of their computers. So a lot of this is done, done remotely. Um, so if you ask where my lab is, it's sort of distributed. Some of the people aren't even in the city. They're in, and we we run collaborations. I work with people in right. different parts of this country and and all, yeah. all around the world. So it, the model has rather changed from just being the single investigator with his postdocs and PhD students working away in a laboratory to a much more distributed type of structure. Right, right, right. Is there any kind of uh, so other so yeah the computational part? Obviously, that's a big part of what you do. And I from even my time. A decade ago, working on these problems with you, we had big dedicated servers. You were always getting the state of the art. You had yeah. access to supercomputing clusters for some of these problems. Um, so, you know, obviously there's that computational component and a big part of what your lab does is, is tackling these computational issues because yeah. of the kinds of problems you're describing. Huge data sets where for each individual, so just talking about the scale for your project alone, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people and for each of those people, you have millions of uh, pieces of information about their genetics, yeah. plus also information about environmental factors that they yes. encountered, yeah. uh, behavioral attributes yeah. specifically related to depression. Um, so huge amounts of data. And obviously that ends up being a big part of what it means to be a geneticist today, for the most part, um, except for those people sucking up fruit flies. <laughs> uh in their plastic tubes i can't remember how you phrased that but uh um but then there is there still a lab component do some people do some of your phd students or postdocs are they involved in the collection of samples or is, does that somehow is that contracted out how does that work uh so let's break that down a bit we we do run lab based projects um and that's really picking up on your question about if we found genes, what's the value and how can we understand them? Because we would like to understand the mechanisms and we need, need to think quite carefully about uh, how to do that. And that ends up being a combination of, sort of molecular biology and some functional testing and, and, and so on. So yes, we have, have a, a, a small amount of people doing that. But fundamentally, I think that we need to make progress with this question of subtyping, this question of gene identification uh, before we really move in, into the laboratory. So most of what we're doing has been focused on, on the sample collection. And the sample collection, because it's on a large scale, has to be, I wouldn't say automated, but it, it's, um, it's not contracted out to another group, but we work with hospitals. Um, I currently spend um, a fair amount of time working with our South Korean colleagues. Uh, we translated... Um, obviously with their help, our uh, assessments. We developed a, um, it's a, a, we use a red cap system for distributing the, uh, 
and collecting the data on, on the subjects. We need to train the physicians so that they know how to get the best answers. Uh, and then we have all of the downstream data analysis and QC that follows uh, from that. And as an aside, one of the things that we have done is we've been recording the interviews uh, mm. of the depression. And the study that we carried out in China included mm, about 10,000 people. It was all women. Um, we chose women because the genetic effects on women are not the same as the genetic effects on men. Uh, mm. And it's another example of heterogeneity. So we wanted to make it as homogenous as possible. And they're all between the ages of uh, 40 and 60, really. So we chose them. And they all have recurrent major depression found in hospitals. And about 80% of those agreed to have their interview recorded. And we edited those. We, we check. We have a, a group of editors who listen. And if we think that they haven't made a good diagnosis, then we feed back to the interviewers and we may edit as a, as a wow. consequence of the data. And after that study was completed, we have these 8,000 recordings. And I suddenly thought, well, why don't we use this as a phenotype? Yeah, that was my next we, question. We, we recognize people by their voices. It's a very individual feature. You can recognize, you know, when you pick up the phone and it's your mum, you tell within a few seconds. Uh, yeah. And uh, we also know that you can recognize mood. If we say, something wrong with you, Johnny, feeling okay. <laughs> you know, you're sounding a little sad. So what about us do we recognize in your voice that I say you sound a bit sad today? So this is a problem that, of course, um, really falls into the, the realm of the electronic engineers. And we set up a, a collaboration with the engineers here. It's a great thing to do in UCLA, very collaborative place. And I said, can you extract data from these um, recordings and tell me, without knowing, which of the depressed patients and which aren't? Now, my first surprise was that the vocal engineers here, they, they the audio engineers, they take out hundreds of features. So we gave them like an hour and a half recording. And just from a couple of minutes, they're extracting 700 features. Mm -hmm. So it's a very rich data set for them. Uh, and they can do this, of course, longitudinally. So they've got a whole hour to go through. So not only are they pulling this out, as it were, horizontally, but they can look across the whole interview and extract data. So then we thought, okay, so now we've got a very high dimensional data set at a phenotypic level. Instead of just saying plus or minus depression, we've got 700 features. And we've got 10 million data points on their genetics. And we've got this on 8,000 people. So like we've got 10,000 by 5 million by 800. This is an enormously complicated data set now. So right, how right, can we right. use that in order to, in a, in a more sophisticated fashion, identify uh, subgroups? Can we use it to identify features which, which would be predictive of depression? And it has the longer term goal that potentially if this all works well, that we can just have a recording going on, let's say, in the emergency room in the background, mm -hmm. or when a patient rings up a doctor, there's something just automatically processing the, uh, the recording, and an alert comes up, that patient's depressed. Please go and speak to them. Maybe Ooh. we'll be picking up before the subjects themselves know, and I right. think that allows us to intervene earlier and potentially save lives. Wow, that is super interesting. I had no idea that that was going on. Makes a lot of sense to make use of those data. Mm -hmm. And brings me to my next question, which is what kinds of tools do you use, or I guess does your lab use to be handling these kinds of massive data sets? Mm -hmm. So I know when I was doing my PhD with you, I mostly used R for everything, mm -hmm. uh, some MATLAB. Um, and now I'm basically Python all the time. So, yeah, you were using R all the time uh, as well. That was your primary thing yeah. a decade ago. Well, I have to say I hate Python with a great hatred. <laughs> it's data, it's a memory is like crap, and you have to get like 10 different versions of it because one, like the, all the, some modules in one version don't work in another. It's, oh. But everyone uses it, John, so I'm <laughs> losing that battle. So everyone's still using Python and R. And the other thing I'd really wish they'd move over to, and I've had this conversation with a number of people, is Julia, which has got much better memory handling capacity. It's much cleaner, runs fast, but unfortunately doesn't have all of those nice, easy libraries that you can just plug in. So if you want to run some regression, you know, you could, may even have to write the code yourself, heaven forbid. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that, that is something, you know, I haven't dabbled in Julia at all, but um, I did, uh, 
near the end of last year, I did a series of episodes on the highest paying data tools. And Julia emerged as something that you really should be learning um, if you want to get paid more <laughs> as a data scientist, um, because it's relatively niche, but the, the people who do use it command higher pay. And it seems like these kinds of efficiency things that you describe that are shortcomings for Python. Yeah, it seems like that is primarily why Julia was created, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's dealing with those. those I, I mean, I was amazed to discover how poor some of the, the memory um, demands are in in uh, in Python. That we were always having to sort of uh, fiddle to get extra requests on on nodes and things to get it up, get it up and running. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas Julia doesn't have those problems. It's been a much better. Very cool. Better software. Well, so are there any particular R or Python or maybe even Julia packages that uh, come up a lot in your work? I remember back mm. when I was working, there was like the bioconductor package was a big thing in R. For yeah, so that's data. really for, uh, for, for, yes, for a lot of the, the genomic analysis and so on. But to be honest, a lot of this is now just done with, um, we're, we're interested in, in um, uh, one of the groups that I work with which does a lot of work on um um, contrastive PCA and um, various data reduction techniques uh, in order to pick up uh, signals. And um, so th those sorts of approaches are, are becoming increasingly important. And we are, and I've been pressing our group to think more about machine learning analyses to deal with this, but it's not, not, uh, we're not there yet by a long way. I mean, uh, to, to give you a simple example of the sorts of problems we've got, so currently, we make a diagnosis of depression by talking to you. So I sit you down and I say, how are you feeling depressed and how long for? And I ask you these questions. And then I ask you about how that's been going on for the last two weeks. And um, if you break that barrier, then I give you a, a diagnosis. You meet, meet criteria. Now, um, I have no idea what will happen when you leave my clinic and I'm going to see you in two weeks and I have no information from you apart from what you will give me when you return. And we want to break down two barriers. We want to break down this uh, entirely subjective uh, de dependence on subjective information and we want to break down our dependence on getting information from you at a single time point. Right. And uh, the inevitable tool for your oh, listeners, it's my phone, uh, is to take information off, off your phone. And we piloted this in a group of about three or 400 students. And um, they have been carrying around the AWARE platform. It's a freely available um, data extraction tool. It sort of queries sensors on your phone and has been sending us information about very simple things, activity, uh, GPS location, uh, phone screen time. Not surprisingly, perhaps, phone screen time is uh, a really good predictor of sleep. First thing anyone does in the morning is turn on their phone, and the right. last thing they do is put it by their bed and it goes to sleep. Oh, I thought That's you were about we to get... say that screen time, in terms of uh, how much time somebody spends, is a great predictor of depression. Well, that's what we've been investigating. And uh, you won't be surprised that indeed um, we detect a correlation between uh, activity levels. So people are not moving around, they're not using their phone so much, and that does indeed predict their mood state. Um, so that's that's been quite a, uh, 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 I was quite surprised how, how how we could do that. But the but the but if you if you think about how you might analyze these data, so I've, I've got data. This is a relatively small sample for us, a few thousand uh, students, mm -hmm. uh, but taken over a, a long period of time, like six weeks. So my question is, how do I recognize those students who are depressed? And most people, I think, consider that problem as a contrastive one. So I have a group of students who are not depressed and I have a group of students who are depressed, what are the features off on their phone sensors that separate those two groups? Right. And you will see something. It's not a strong signal. But clinically, that's actually not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the change in an individual. So we have longitudinal data. So my question here was, why don't we reframe this? Uh, and the first reframing was just as a hidden Markov model. So could you think about the change in state just like just model that as an HMM, mm -hmm. and uh, over time, then see what the what the uh, whether you're getting any, any changes in state which were beyond what you would expect. So we we now divide it up into a training set, look at about seventy percent of the people, and then look in, and then take that into the 
into the next 30% and see how good our predictions are. And accuracy at the moment is surprisingly high that we can, with about 80 to 90% uh, accurately predict. And, but although that's good, clinically, that might not be anywhere near enough because I'm really only interested in, in those people who get so depressed that they might kill themselves at this stage. And I don't want to, I want 100% accuracy for that. I can't afford to miss a single person. Uh, so we have a way to go with this. But it's a, at least we're beginning to think about this, I think, in the right way. We have the sorts of data sets that will help us. That ties nicely back to that church crypt in your childhood. Indeed it does. Yeah. Indeed. Um, so it sounds like there is a growing opportunity for data scientists, machine learning practitioners, probably software developers to be involved in genetics. So you're collecting huge amounts of data, but it mm -hmm. sounds like there's still way more analysis that could be done. It kind of sounded like you're getting started on a lot of these projects. So how does somebody get involved uh, with you, with a project like this? Mm. And actually, I'd like to tell a quick story for the audience, which uh, I think you'll find interesting too, which is how I picked you as a PhD supervisor. So, um, so I'd come, I'd come from an undergrad where I'd largely, I'd done an undergrad in neuroscience and I'd done lots of computational stuff. I'd done, you know, writing statistical and programming scripts to be analyzing relatively large data sets. I had done, um, uh, for two years in my undergrad, I did an fMRI project. And so I imagined that going off to Oxford and doing a PhD there, I would continue to do brain imaging work. And... Oxford still has this brilliant program. Uh, so the Wellcome Trust, which until the, until the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was created, was the largest medical charity in the world. Um, it, it predominantly spends money in the UK. Uh, it comes out of a, a pharmaceutical fortune from Henry Wellcome. And um, so they fund these brilliant four-year PhD programs, which in the UK is somewhat unusual. So in the UK, you typically get PhD funding for three years, but these four-year programs give you a one-year master's beforehand, wherein you can have lots of lectures from lots of different faculty members, and you can do research projects in several different labs to see what's a good fit for you. And so this is great even for somebody like me who came from a neuroscience background, but it's especially great for somebody who comes from a physics background or a medical background and they are getting started in neuroscience for the first time. So there's, there's this year to get acclimatized to the field, uh, to try lots of different projects, have lectures from lots of uh, different brilliant uh, lecturers in different fields. And so uh, in my first term in Oxford, you did, I think, just one lecture. But I loved it. I loved your style, the way that you presented information, the way that you were passionate about what you're doing and the way that you answered everyone's questions. And so I didn't really care what you were studying. <laughs> uh, I was just like, I want to work with that guy. Um, although I had, I had done some genetics in my undergrad as well. And so I knew a bit, um, but yeah, mostly just wanted to be working with you. And that's actually, that's something I've talked about on our episodes before, but my career has been guided by that basically. Uh, every step of the way, pretty much my career decisions have been based on, wow, what an interesting person. I would love to be working with this person. So then, uh, and you actually, you tried, you tried to get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, so yeah. I asked if I could have a conversation with you, if, you, if I could do a master's project, one of, my, you know, one of my term projects with you for a few months. And you said, oh, you don't really want to do it with me. Look at these other interesting projects that other labs are doing. This would be far more interesting for you to do. And I said, no, 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 no. I really want to do this with you. And then when it came time for me to choose at the end of that master's, um, yeah, so I, one of my big master's projects was a brain imaging project. Uh, and the other one was with you. And I loved the other project. Absolutely would have, uh, you know, I think that would have been a grand PhD as well. But uh, yeah, really wanted to do that with you. And so uh, I can vouch for, uh, you know, working with you as a wonderful experience and uh, I gained a tremendous amount uh, for as an academic at that time. And then through the rest of my career, uh, you're quite a pragmatic uh, leader and uh, you know, an outstanding communicator, not just in terms of lecturing, but also in terms of 
um, you know, communicating what you're looking for in somebody. And you're, uh, you put a lot of time into helping everyone out in the lab and succeeding at their project. So I can highly recommend working with you. So how does somebody get involved in working with you on the depression grant? Let me, let me say two things, John. Um, firstly, I want to thank you for the encomonium <laughs> and, um, just, I'm very pleased that you used your coding skills that you learned in our laboratory to, to good effect. Um, but just to reiterate what I said at the beginning, particularly for dealing with these psychiatric conditions that I mentioned, anyone can help. Anyone can get involved. You don't. And uh, it, we'd love to have you in the lab and get you involved in various other ways and as a, as a scientist. But can I just also point out that this is something that anyone can help with. If you see someone who's depressed, please reach out to them. There is a belief that if someone is depressed and you ask them, have you thought of committing suicide, you might precipitate that. It is not only not true, it actually huh. could help people if you were to say that. And it may you may even save somebody's life. Wow. So listening, as I've pointed out at the very beginning of, of our of our talk, is 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 important, just listening and then reaching out to those who are desperate. Uh, don't hesitate. So those are two very simple things that anyone can do. Now, if you want to be more proactive, if you want to come and help us work out what the causes are as a first step towards developing new treatment, send me an email. There's stuff that we can, you, you can do stuff. We'll find something for you to do. I mean, this is such a big problem and we are so distributed across the planet. I think you, you're now realizing we're running programs in so many different countries. We want to do this um, everywhere. So, so anyone can be involved at any level. And I imagine also at uh, the donor level, if they well, were. Well, it's funny by... you should mention that. But yes, <laughs> the one thing we're always short of, as you discovered when you asked me what I spend most of my time doing, is unfortunately money. So, yes, if anyone wants to contribute that way, but uh, any form of contribution, financial would be great. But if it's just your time, your energy, that's also great too. Awesome. Um... Really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, again, another pragmatic uh, piece of advice. I didn't know that, for example, uh, I didn't know that by asking somebody if they were contemplating suicide, I, I, I was in the camp that I thought that maybe that would be. Yeah, every, everyone so thinks that. Yeah, no, don't, don't hesitate. Wow. Like, it's hard to say, and uh, like, don't tell yourself off if you don't manage it, because I know what it feels like when you're sitting with somebody who's got their head in their hands and doesn't want to talk with you and reaching over them to say, are you thinking of killing themselves? Seems like the worst thing to be doing, but it's not. Huh. Well, there you go. So a uh, great piece of advice there. So I would like to turn over now to some audience questions. So I asked on LinkedIn and Twitter uh, a week before we filmed uh, to see if there were any particular questions that people had for a, an expert in uh, psychiatric genetics such as yourself. And um, some of them we've actually answered in the course of the discussion here. So uh, Mohammed Hussein, who's a data scientist, um, asked, what if depression has nothing to do with genes? We've already talked about that. We know from uh, twin studies that it certainly does and lots of other subsequent studies. Um, but here's an interesting one. So I think it follows on from his question of what if depression has nothing to do with genes? He asks, which cultures have the least depressed is mm. that something that you have insight into? It's a very, it's a very good question. We don't have a, a, a really good answer to that. And the reason we don't have a good answer to that is because the difficulty in making a diagnosis. But that said, for those countries where people have made the effort, uh, a big effort, uh, to go out and interview people and, and try and make sure, it, doesn't, it does appear that East Asian countries um, have less depression. I'll tell you one anecdote, though, just um, on this, which might also cast some light on some other issues. Um, I was told this by a, a journalist. Uh, so some years ago, not many years ago now, um, drug companies were not selling any antidepressants in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, they want to sell antidepressants, it's a good money earner for them. So they're very surprised. They're like, is it because there's no depression in Japan? That doesn't, that, that doesn't make much sense. So they commissioned some um, people to look into this, and um, the result came back that it was really a question of how the question about mood was being framed, and that right. for the Japanese population, going in and asking whether you were depressed wasn't, wasn't working. 
So instead, they came up with the following. They had an advertising campaign. And on the advertising campaign, a man turns up looking like he's suffering from COVID-19. His nose is streaming. He's coughing. He's looking a bit unwell. And the, and the, the uh, audio says, you have a cold. We'll give you a remedy for your cold. And then it cuts to a man with his head in his hands looking very unhappy. This person has a cold on the heart. And the remedy ah. for the cold on the heart is the antidepressant. Ah. And very happily for the drug companies, sales of <laughs> antidepressants rocketed. Right. So, yeah, there is a big cultural thing here yeah. where it's hard to know for sure if we're defining it in the same way. Yeah. And, yeah, that occurred to me. I didn't, I didn't want to completely derail the conversation earlier. But when you were talking about having your studies be used in... Korea, in South America. Um, so yeah, you have to train up people to be collecting the data properly, connecting the, the, collecting the saliva samples or whatever properly. But the hard part would be making sure that you're asking the questions mm. in the mm. same way. Um, when there's so much um, yeah, cultural influence mm. on just mm. what depression mm. means. So yeah, I imagine that's one of the trickier bits. Well, that's why we spend a lot of time training our interviewers and why we have a set of editors who listen in, why we record the interviews to check on this. There's a, there's a whole other science around how you acquire information from people. And as you, you won't be surprised to know that the advertising agencies have most experience about this. How do you frame the questions uh, mm. and how do you collect the information? There's a things like um, interviewer response. Uh, uh, fatigue that after you've been giving the same interview for some months that you're not going to be listening so much and you'll rush through the questions or all sorts of little details that we need to be uh, careful about dealing with right very interesting all right so another question here comes from hank yun who is a data integrations engineer at riskified and he's also a former uh, student of mine on my deep learning course that i used to offer at the new york city data science academy and he would love to know if your research is more hypothesis driven or data driven, um, or does it really depend on the situation? So we use the data in order to generate hypotheses. And as you gathered from everything we've been talking about today, at the moment, we're not really in the hypothesis generating stage. We have some general questions we want answered uh, and the data will help us, I hope, begin to formulate much clearer hypotheses. Cool. A great question from Hank and a really clear answer from you, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, so some of this uh, we've already we've already talked about. So we have questions here from uh, Serge Massis, who is a data scientist and an author on interpretable machine learning. And he was also recently a guest on the program. So he was a guest on episode number 539, uh, a really brilliant episode that I can highly recommend. So um, Serge uh, was interested in something that we already asked about earlier, which is, uh, you know, what proportion is genetic and environmental, but he mm -hmm. also asked, does he also asked how much of it is epigenetic, which is something that we haven't touched on at all in this episode, Jonathan. So what is epigenetics and, and how is that relevant in depression? So epigenetics is the sort of thing that everyone resorts to when they can't get <laughs> genetics to work and they throw up their hands and they say, oh, it must be epigenetics. But more seriously, epigenetics simply, it's, it's the study of gene regulation, how genes are turned, uh, the, the transcripts from the genes are turned on and off, and how all that information wrapped up in your DNA is converted into something useful for the, um, uh, for the cell. Uh, so that sort of effect is really what we will be interested in looking at once we know the primary questions. Uh, there's little point in looking at gene regulation until you know which genes to look at. And we won't know which genes to look at until we've solved these questions about heterogeneity and uh, underlying genetic causes. Outstanding answer, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Um, I learned a lot in that response as well. And Serge has a completely unrelated question, um, but except that it's also related to depression, which is... Um, is there indeed a depression epidemic brought on by social media mm. and mobile devices? And if so, what measures can be taken with technology to tackle that depression epidemic? Well, there's certainly a depression epidemic being inflicted upon all of us now by the pandemic. 
Uh, mm. There's increasing evidence uh, for that, unfortunately, due to the isolation and so on. Uh, I don't see very much evidence that social media can be blamed. Um, whether it can be used to help, I don't know. I'm not a good person to ask about this. I have a deep hatred for social media, so... <laughs> Come on, Jonathan. It's um, very trendy right now to be hating I know, big tech and I just, companies. Not, we need I, your help here. Uh, I do use it, so it's not like I don't look on Twitter for information and, and so on. But uh, no, I don't know really. I don't really. That's a good question. I would need to think a bit more carefully about. Yeah, yeah. No, no worries. That. that is, that is. It's not exactly a psychiatric genetics question. <laughs> more of a general interest. More question. of a general interest. Yeah. But uh, very nice to get your response on that. So. Jonathan, a question that I rarely ask my guests, I save it for very special occasions, and you are certainly a very special guest. Um, I love to kind of frame this time that we're at as truly unique. We have ever cheaper data storage, ever cheaper compute, ever more abundant sensors everywhere. You know, these kinds of experiments you're describing where you can be having a phone in somebody's pocket and using that information to be trying to understand genetics. I mean, even just having genomic data, collecting genomic mm -hmm. data, that's a, it's a very specific example of how data collection and storage is getting uh, exponentially cheaper uh, as years go on. Um, on top of that, we have unparalleled interconnectivity. You can be collaborating on these genetic data and behavioral data uh, with labs all over the world. and um, those labs can be publishing papers or publishing code to GitHub, and then everyone in your lab can make use of it. So these kinds of innovations are having a big impact in every industry, but in yours in particular. So altogether, there's this unbelievable uh, pace of innovation. So what excites you about the future? What do you think could happen with technology in general or maybe in psychiatric genetics in particular? I told you a little bit about this. I told you that we've been using phones to collect data on our students, but we can definitely do better than that. And about a year ago, we signed a contract uh, with Apple. And mm. Apple manufactures a watch. I thought watches were for telling the time. And, uh, <laughs> and I thought maybe the Apple watch was for telling the time plus answering your email and browsing your social media. But it turns out that Apple's main interest is actually in health. And mm -hmm. they market this as a way of uh, monitoring your cardiovascular health. And they think that the biggest advance they've made is that your watch will remind you occasionally to stand up. So if there's anything that would improve your cardiovascular health, get a bit more right. exercise, just standing up occasionally is going right. to be useful. Now they've solved cardiovascular disease. They want to take on psychiatric disease. Mm -hmm. And we had a number of conversations with them. We went up to that big um, UFO building in San Jose and chatted with their executives about this and um, pitched to them the idea that we become their center for testing their technology. And we've been doing that now wow. for about a year. Yes. And we're collecting information from their watches and from a, a series of other sensors, which will give us, we hope, the most rounded total view of how much information these sensors can give us that will actually be allow us to, to predict something about mood. All right, so that is a very specific example in the not too distant future. But what do you think beyond that? I mean, in decades, what could be possible if, if we had millions of genomes sequenced and great behavioral data from uh, the Apple uh, brain implant that, or at least body implant that we have in the future that has you know, lots of biochemical data being tracked in it. Is there, you know, is there something you know, for, for the next generations? Uh, you know, might, might depression be treated in a completely different manner than it is today? I, I'm, I will be very surprised if we don't make a radical advance along the way you, you've suggested. And um, I think there are probably two um, lines of uh, research which are going to give us uh, these sorts of um, breakthroughs. One is the one I've just mentioned, which is collecting all of these data sets. And I think in the end, we're going to work out that there are a few bits of useful information that we can get. And ideally, we, we, we would like um, for you to be told before things get bad. We want to, we'd really want to prevent right. disease rather than to have to cure it. 
And if there were simple, I mean, that's, it's just going back to the Apple Watch idea that I can get you to stand up and, and prevent you getting cardiovascular disease. What type of inter interventions would our right. information give us that would say, do this, don't do that? What are, what are good mental health behaviors which will prevent you getting depressed? And there's a lot of work in the in the in cognitive therapy around this, teaching you how to deal with situations. But there may turn out to be much simpler interventions based on your behavior and what we learn, which would help. What those are, I have no idea, but I suspect that will that will that will that will turn up in the next five to ten years. And the second thing is that as we move forward with our ability to interrogate entire genomes and to go back to some of the conversations we had earlier, we are learning so much more about brain function. I mean, it, the, the advances in neuroscience have, are staggering. Our ability now to interrogate individual neurons, their contents, we can pull out, suck out from that little cell all the little things that it's got inside it. We can categorize them, catalog them, see how they match up with what other cells are doing. And increasingly, mm -hmm. we're being, being able to do that as, and interrogate the function at the same time. We talked a little bit about optogenetics and the access we're getting into in, into mammalian brains to see what, what they do. So within 10 years or so, that information should be giving us a much clearer idea of what, what happens to a brain when it's depressed. And I suspect that we'll come up with some, some, some great surprises. The, the thing that maybe you and your listeners don't know, and I, it's always a bit of a surprise this, is that all, although we have these wonderful technologies and we know so much um, more than we ever did about what brains consist of, our ideas, our hypotheses about how brains function are really limited at the moment. There, isn't, there are very few theories. And if you, if you go and quiz, if you, if you want some fun, go into a bar where there's a lot of neuroscientists and just ask them what, what a memory is. Like, how's it, what is a memory? How's it laid down? And... Right. Uh, and is it even simple things like is it digital or is it analog? Where does it, and where is it in the brain? And we, you know, there'll be a lot of hand waving and there'll be some arguments and so on. But it's a, it's a, we we definitely need breakthroughs just in generating hypotheses about how brains work. And that's another issue for your listeners. If you want to get involved, start reading these papers because we do need people who think out of the box to come in and really understand what type of questions we, sh we should be answering. And then I think one other thing that's just worth bearing in mind, this is another conversation I, I've had here. As you know, artificial intelligence is pretty good at now at, at, um, at allowing us to um, speak to computers. And does this mean that if I write, let's say, a grant proposal in which I say, I want to understand how brains interpret sound, because I'm interested in some application of that, then my grant will get turned down because the reviewing body will say, well, we don't need to know that because we have AI. And AI has solved this problem of how brains uh -huh. process sound because we, we can just do it on a computer. Uh -huh. And to what extent in our ability to sort of make predictions based on large data sets, are we missing, uh, avoiding, perhaps necessarily, the need to come up with hypothesis-driven science just because things become so practical. And if I could apply some big AI machinery to all of the data we've collected and just use it to predict who and who is not depressed, bypassing any indication of the biology, don't need any genetics, just machine learning, brute force approaches so that I can intervene and start giving them treatment, is that gonna be enough? And I think that's a question we don't really address, uh, perhaps with the seriousness that it deserves. Right. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. It is interesting how a lot of interventions we don't understand, though, uh, right? Like anesthetics. I don't think we don't know how anesthetics work, uh, how people can, you know, temporarily not be conscious and yeah. then be conscious again. And antidepressants as well, right? Yeah, well, we we part, don't know how any psychiatric drug works. Right, right. I mean, very, very, I mean, we don't even know why alcohol makes us <laughs> relaxed and uh, happy. Why, you know, we don't, substances, you know, there's ethanol, it's got about six, you know, constituents. Well, what, what, why, why don't we understand even that? Right. Yeah. I mean, we don't understand how consciousness arises. Uh, That's an even bigger question. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
seems like we basically don't know anything, but we can collect a whole bunch of data. So we're going to keep doing it. We're going to yeah. genotype we're, more people. We're, we're data data scientists. More data. We're computer <laughs> scientists and data scientists. We we will just collect data. That's true. Yeah. Um, all right. And then I I like this idea you're talking about. <clears throat> uh, you know, looking to the future and what an Apple Watch or or what technology could be doing, and so maybe in addition to Apple Watches in the future telling you to stand up, they'll also ask you, are you contemplating killing yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that'll happen. Who knows? I hope it's um, in a slightly more sophisticated fashion than that. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. And then Jonathan, we end all of our episodes with a book recommendation other than your own book. Do you have happen to have one for us? Well, I have the second edition as well, as you know. So I think that is at least two book recommendations. Once you get through the first, then try the second. <laughs> All right. Well, um, the book that I've been reading a lot and keep going back to is by Scott Aronson. Uh, it's called um, Quantum Com I may get the title wrong. Quantum Computing Since the Age of Democritus or something like that. Uh, it says on the back, and it's true, this book will make you fall about laughing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, that sounds like a fun one. I actually, I need something funny to read. I find it, uh, I, I often want something fun to read. I spend my day reading quite serious things. And uh, yeah, often struggle to find something funny. Uh, read a bunch of Douglas Adams for a while. Uh, and that's pretty funny, but yeah, I don't know. I want something else. Okay. Get to Scott. He'll tell you something that'll make you laugh. Nice. All right. And then Jonathan, uh, how should we get in touch with you? You mentioned earlier that uh, we could just email you. E so email's can... best, yeah. yeah. jflint Wonderful. at mednet.ucla.edu. Or nice you can way. just look me up on the internet. It's pretty accessible. Yeah, yeah. we'll be sure to have your, uh, your website as well as your email address in the show notes. All right, Jonathan, it's been absolutely wonderful to catch up with you today. Thank you so much for joining me on the Super Data Science Podcast. And maybe we can have you on again in the future to give us an update on how it's going. It's been a great pleasure, John. Thank you very much. I'll look forward to our next meeting. Well, can you see why I chose Professor Flint as my doctoral supervisor? My goodness. It's remarkable that somebody so extraordinarily industrious and intelligent is also capable of such deep empathy and clear communication. He's somebody who's changing the world dramatically, and I'm honored that he was willing to spend time with us on the show. In today's episode, Jonathan enlightened us on how studies of twins indicate that about 35% of the susceptibility to psychiatric disorders like depression is genetic. How the single disease that we call depression today is likely to be many different diseases, each with its own distinct genetic basis. How computational techniques like statistics and machine learning are critical to identifying causal patterns within the vast troves of genomic data collected today, and how this trend will only increase in the years to come. How the programming language Julia has been markedly more memory efficient than the more widely used Python language in his experience. How contrastive principal component analysis and hidden Markov models have been particularly useful techniques for him for analyzing genetic data and we could even save a life by asking whether someone is thinking of taking their own life. Now that's practical advice. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Jonathan's Twitter profile, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com 547. That's superdatascience.com 547. If you'd like to ask questions of future guests on the show, like several audience members did of Professor Flint during today's episode, then consider following me on LinkedIn or Twitter, as that's where I post who upcoming guests are and ask you for your thoughtful inquiries. All right. Thank you to Ivana, Mario, Jaime, JP, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for managing and producing another deeply stimulating episode for us today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon.